This year has a lot in store for the Middle East. Social unrest, economic reforms, political power vacuums and a whole lot more fighting. Libya finds itself in the eye of the storm as foreign powers flock to the country to fight on opposite ends. Iran and the United States are headed towards a new political crisis. Turkey is flexing its muscles in the Mediterranean and the Arab world is fragmented as ever. As the region enters the new year, ordinary citizens are yet to catch a break. So let's look underneath the surface and talk about the trends for the Middle East in 2020. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Digital life makes things easier, but it also leaves fingerprints everywhere. Whether it's shopping, watching films, browsing through websites, or using public Wi-Fi. NordVPN makes your internet activity secure and protects you from hackers, ISP operators, and even malicious websites. It allows you to enjoy your favorite content securely even when you're away from home. All it takes is a click of the mouse. Visit nordvpn.com slash CaspianReport and use the promo code CaspianReport to get 70% off this powerful app. Tensions between the United States and Iran rose dangerously in 2019 and the year ahead could bring the rivalry to boiling point. With the death of Iranian General Soleimani, Tehran is likely to accelerate its nuclear program by using more advanced centrifuges and restricting the International Atomic Energy Agency from accessing nuclear sites. The joker in the pack is the Arak facility. If the Iranian leadership decides to restart the construction of the Arak heavy water nuclear reactor, as is hinted by state officials, it would grant the Iranians the capacity to enrich enough fissile material for one or two nuclear bombs each year. Iran would then need to develop the technology to turn that material into a nuclear weapon, but much of the weaponization process would happen covertly and there is no telling how long that would take. Either way, make no mistake about it, with the way things are, the United States and Iran are headed towards a new political crisis by the summer. So it's essential that in the coming months, backdoor diplomacy de-escalates tensions through compromise. If diplomacy succeeds, the public will never learn about it, but if it fails, we're looking at increased hostility. As part of the proxy conflict in the Middle East, Iran and its militias are likely to strike at US assets in Iraq, while disrupting tanker traffic in the Persian Gulf. Beyond its immediate borders, the Iranians could resort to cyber attacks. The strategy in Tehran will be to catch its rivals off guard by hitting them in unpredictable and asymmetric ways. Throughout 2020, the stakes will remain high and some of the Arab Gulf states have shown signs of de-escalation. For instance, the United Arab Emirates has opened new lines of communication with their Iranian counterparts, while Saudi Arabia is now negotiating directly with the Houthi rebels in Yemen for a peace deal. The latter point is a significant breakthrough. After years of ineffective combat, the Saudis appear to have lost their appetite for conflict. Now this was bound to happen sooner or later. The Saudi military simply wasn't up to the task. Financial resources are stretched thinly and the government has prioritized socio-economic reforms. Going into 2020, the Saudi leadership will seek for a compromise with the Houthi rebels. The bare minimum for such a deal is for the Houthis to gain a lasting seat in Yemen's political future, which opens the door to long-term Iranian influence on the Arabian Peninsula. So there are a lot of dimensions to reconsider and the deal may collapse under its own weight. But at least the combatants are open for a diplomatic resolution. Elsewhere in Saudi Arabia, low oil prices will hurt economic growth and undercut the Vision 2030 initiative, which is behind schedule. Despite the IPO of Saudi Aramco, foreign investors are spooked by the regional frictions involving Iran. To get its socio-economic reforms back on track and to reassure investors, Riyadh is likely to seek a risk-free foreign policy this year, which explains the change of heart in Yemen and possibly even towards Iran. Israel, meanwhile, will face a more politically and culturally divided year than before. Two distinct elections have failed to result in a viable government 
and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is refusing to step down in face of corruption indictments. The political crisis in Israel is fueled by a culture war between secular and religious forces and concern the very identity of the state and its citizens. The danger is that the mainstream political parties will become increasingly willing to ally with radical political parties to form a coalition government. Under these stressful circumstances, it's possible that the right-wing groups push to annex the West Bank completely in order to preserve their hold on power. The power vacuum in Israel is significant, but it will not distract the Israelis from the threat posed by Iran. No matter what government emerges from the political crisis in the coming year, Israel is likely to keep a close eye on Iran. Its military will also keep striking at pro-Iranian targets in the region as it had the year before. As for the latest proposed peace deal with Palestine, it will go nowhere. Though the Palestinians have rejected it, their Arab kin in Egypt, Oman, Morocco, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates have embraced it. Much of the Arab world simply wants to reconcile with Israel and gain access to Israeli technology in the spheres of agriculture, cybersecurity, water treatment, etc. Plus, many Arab governments consider Iran and Turkey to be more pressing threats than Israel. Be that as it may, the Arab-Israeli conflict will remain unresolved this year. The Palestinians may be without a state, but they possess the strongest bargaining chip regarding the relationship between Israel and the Arab world. And as long as the Palestinians are not aboard, an authentic peace deal will have to wait. In Lebanon and Iraq, mass anti-government protests will linger through 2020. Despite the distance between the two, Lebanon and Iraq are similar in many ways. Both governments are inefficient, corrupt and fail to deliver what their citizens need. That said, both political bodies were designed to resolve or prevent internal conflicts. Producing an effective form of governance was never a priority. In both nations, state positions were carefully appointed to specific leaders of various clans and sects. Over time, this administrative system entrenched the civil service in kleptocracy. The unrest we're seeing today is the result of those government structures. And unless the governing bodies of Lebanon and Iraq collapse completely, things will not change for the countries, regardless of how the popular unrest grows. At best, we might see some electoral reforms and the appointment of some technocrats in 2020. Moving on to Egypt, where President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi will be preoccupied with socio-economic reforms as well as white elephant projects such as the new administrative capital near Cairo at the edge of the Nile Delta. One noteworthy development though is that al-Sisi has secured a deal with his Emirati counterpart to set up a $20 billion fund to invest in various sectors. The aim is to revive the Egyptian economy and as an additional measure, lawmakers in Cairo are now considering to offer stakes as much as 100% in some military linked firms. Currently, the military oligarchy controls more than 50% of the national GDP, but if the new proposals hold true, it would be a compelling first step to attract much needed private investment. To the north in Turkey, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is entering a period of political decline. His approval rating is slipping, especially among the youth, and his ruling coalition is showing signs of friction. Several members of the ruling party have already defected and some high-profile officials are currently in the process of establishing new political movements. Erdogan has a history of irrational conduct to threats, so he is likely to repress critics while beating the drums of nationalism to stir up populist support. In the arena of foreign policy, the Turkish president has played his hand poorly. Relations with the United States will fall to new lows when the US congressional sanctions will take effect in the first half of the year. These sanctions are likely to put increasing pressure on the Turkish lira. In addition, the ongoing court in the state of New York regarding the Turkish Hulk Bank could result in a steep fine going into the billions of dollars. 
The Turkish bank is charged for its participation in a multi-billion dollar Iranian sanctions evasion program and the trial is likely to release controversial details about Erdogan's business empire or those close to him. So we're headed towards some interesting times. Going into 2020, Libya will find itself in the eye of the storm. Over the past year, the stalemate in the country has taken a dangerous new turn. The legal legitimacy is sketchy, but Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar, who operates on behalf of the Tobruk government, has laid siege to Tripoli, where the internationally recognized government is stationed. Both sides have come to rely on foreign support to change the status quo, and today, aside from Libyans fighting each other, there are Emirati drones and airplanes, Russian private military contractors, Sudanese mercenaries, Turkish combat vehicles, all actively involved in Libya. This isn't even mentioning the French, Italians and Greeks who are eyeing to get boots on the ground. The proliferation of foreign actors has obstructed diplomatic efforts to end the conflict. The latest development in the Libyan battle space is that the internationally recognized government of Libya has officially requested air, land and sea support from Ankara to help defend Tripoli. Turkey has some important economic ties to Libya. It's estimated that the Libyan state owes Turkish business tycoons more than $15 billion in unpaid debt. Plus, the Tripoli government has hinted to award Turkish construction firms a host of lucrative reconstruction projects once the civil war ends. For its part, Ankara would lose all its economic ties to Libya should the Tobruk government prevail. The second motive for the Turks is about grand strategy. As part of its defense agreement with the Tripoli government, Turkey has delineated a maritime border with Libya. The new border runs directly from East Libya to South Turkey, but Greece claims that the deal violates its legal claims. Ultimately though, this isn't a question of legality. The thing is, Turkey is excluded from the offshore natural gas pipeline called East Med, which seeks to bring natural gas produced in Cyprus, Egypt and Israel to European markets through the Mediterranean Sea. The newly delineated maritime border with Libya technically blocks the pipeline since it would pass through the waters claimed either by Libya or Turkey. So Ankara has numerous incentives to keep the Tripoli-based government alive for the sake of grand geopolitical designs. In general, the Middle East will see more of the same in 2020, with each power trying to maximize its holdings at the expense of others. The standoff between the United States and Iran, the destructive conflict in Libya and Turkey's strengthening role in the Mediterranean are just some of the stories that need surveillance this year. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. If you approve of our content, hit the like button, subscribe and leave a comment. Any of these sends a positive feedback loop to YouTube's algorithm and ultimately pushes our content to more users. Thank you for watching and Sarol.